Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with Ask Dave. And the ask of Dave was a very, very good question, and one that some of you may have come across in your peregrinations through the world of classical music, and it's this. We all agree, or most agree, that Franck's Symphony in D minor is one of the great masterpieces of romantic symphonism. Why then does it have such a questionable reputation? Why does it come and go? It has periods where everyone loves it and then it disappears and it's always been sort of looked down on. And there are a lot of reasons for it. It's a very complicated and fascinating question in musical aesthetics. But it, essentially, I believe, the issue comes down to questions of national taste in music, nationalism in romantic music particularly. One of the things that we need to keep in mind, and and I do know something about this, by the way, folks. I'm not just speculating. I mean, I, 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 I did teach this at the university level and have a couple of master's degrees in European cultural history with the emphasis on music. So so the idea here is is that European history in the 19th century is one of nationalism. And nationalism, nation building, nation states, national identity, was like a big deal, a very big deal. And it still is a big deal. But it has a, a very, very interesting corollary when it comes to music. Just to define our terms, remember, patriotism is love of one's country. Nationalism is hatred of every other one. And Europeans are nationalists. That's the way it's been, especially in the 19th century, a little bit less so now. But culturally, they have remained so to an alarming and really kind of repulsive degree, a shocking degree when it comes to defining national culture. And when you're talking about romantic music, which was which originated in a, the period of great nationalist ideology, um, things become really kind of sordid and repulsive. The Franck Symphony is looked down on by two major groups, and those two major groups influence how we look at romantic music generally. The first group is the Germans. Musicology, music history, was a, an intellectual and academic discipline that originated in Germany, and a lot of it was fabulous. It, it, because of that, we have, for example, complete editions of Bach and Handel. You know, the attempt to codify and organize what was regarded as German culture. And in the field of symphonic and instrumental music, of course, Germany reigned supreme in the 19th century. So there was a tremendous prejudice in Germany against the French. Remember what Wagner had to say about the French, because as Ned Roram pointed out, Wagner's aesthetic was largely French. And so you, of course, despise the people you don't want to be identified with. And Wagner was big on that. But that's exactly what has happened with the Franck Symphony. There is a general sen sense that A, French people don't write symphonies. And if they do write them, they're not true symphonies. They're not organic, original, symphonic symphonies, especially if they're influenced by the late, rich, chromatic style of Wagner, because Wagner famously said that the symphony was dead, 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 and gone and buried, so much so that when his son Siegfried wrote a symphony, it was hushed up for quite a while among the Wagnerians. It was an embarrassment because he had dared to write a symphony after Big Daddy said you couldn't write symphonies anymore. So the Franck Symphony was a sort of post-Wagnerian French symphony in a very original form. Remember, three movements, um, a central sort of Andante scherzo combo thing in cyclical form with recurring themes like Wagnerian leitmotifs. The result was generally disdained by the Germans who were never going to admit that a French person could write a real symphony. And God knows that he was going to write a real symphony in that particular style, with that particular aesthetic sensibility. So, so it, it, was, it was not going to make much headway in Germany. Now, the other big area of symphonic music that we cared about in the 19th century was, of course, the English-speaking world. And the English-speaking world is really a problem because our cultural taste in the United States was determined pretty much by the British 
and by English music in general, Anglo-Saxon sensibility. And Anglo-Saxon sensibility has always been terrified of France. And the reason is because Anglo-Saxon sex sensibility, see, there I go, the Freudian slip, sensibility, hates sexability. It is, it is terrified of music that expresses sensuality, sexual desire, love, lust, and French music does that supremely well. That's always been like a specialty of French music because French music is primarily theatrical music. It comes from the stage, from the opera, from the ballet, from passion, from that kind of stuff. Whereas British music, well, there really wasn't any. I mean, between Handel and Elgar, there really wasn't any. And the Victorian sensibility was nothing if not prudish. That doesn't mean that they weren't all like sexual freaks. They were. They were psychotically sexual freaks. Why? Precisely for the reason that you couldn't express any kind of frank sensuality in the open. It all had to be suppressed and done behind closed doors and hidden and closeted and all that. But there was always a lot of competition between English culture and French culture. And American and English culture is is by in the 19th century and still by extension what we've heard of it somewhat anti-french you even see it in in the, the writings of someone as famous as donald francis tovey the great english critic and writer and musicologist who we still quote constantly i do he was brilliant but he had a weak spot when it came to french music he always thought that french music suffered from bad taste and the idea of bad taste, I mean, he thought that he called Sanson the greatest composer who wasn't a genius. And when he wrote about the Franck D minor, which he did positively, but denying it the, the appellation of symphony, he said Franck's style was anti-symphonic in its essence and that it was suitable to the creation of symphonic poems. And it didn't matter what they were called. I mean, he admired Franck because Franck was a great composer. He was a great variation writer. He was a great contrapuntist. He wrote the, the greatest body of organ music in the 19th century after Bach. And so he couldn't, he couldn't just, just piss him off, you know, just piss on him and dismiss Franck, but he had to define him as something other than what he was. And therefore, the symphony in D minor was not really a symphony. And as a result of that, it has become a work which people look on as, as being somehow in poor taste. I have no idea what that means. I mean, none. I, as far as I'm concerned, it's a completely meaningless statement. But that's what people said for a long, long time. And they still say that. I don't understand, uh, you know, what that means in terms of the symphony. It's a beautiful symphony with wonderful tunes. And yes, it has a certain sensuality. And what really freaked people out in English speaking countries was the sensuality of French Catholic culture. The church repertoire of church music, you know, it was music that was unbelievably secular and yes, sexy, sensual. Part of this sort of, you know, there's, there's an element of that in Catholic worship generally, and in French Catholicism especially. Um, and it was so offensive to Anglicans, to the, the British puritanical Anglican, whatever they were, streak there, um, that really, really began to disdain French culture. And so, as a result of that, Franck was the, the apotheosis of that, because here he is writing symphonies, and, and Siché works like that, you know? He's really yummy, sensual pieces. Even Franck's wife objected to Sichet, you know, because it was so so yummy and Wagnerian and sexy type stuff. And, and the English didn't know what to make of it. They couldn't handle it. They just couldn't handle it. And to a certain extent, they still don't. I remember reading things in the Penguin Guide about how, you know, about Franck and, and, and matters of taste and that kind of stuff, as if, as if French composers either had none or they had no concept of what was in good taste or poor taste, or what was appropriate or not appropriate. If you read discussions of French music in the 19th century and in the early 20th century, you know, pre-war, let's say, pre-World War II, the issue of taste and taste in France is always coming up, and always to the, to the uh, detriment of French music and French culture, as opposed to the pure, morally elevated, 
English culture and American culture as a result by, you know, the analog to it. And that was really like a horrible thing that happened to music, frankly. Um, I really, really think that it was terrible. And it, and it, it served Franck in a particularly bad way. Now, the last issue with the Franck Symphony is the Franck Symphony. We have to remember, it's his only symphony. He wrote it at the end of his life. Um, its own premiere was, was traumatic. I mean, it was, it was it, the French culture had its own puritanical streak. And it was a particularly puritanical streak when it came to symphonic composition, because the model for the symphony was, of course, Beethoven. And that model, I mean, it was Beethoven symphonies that formed the reason for the foundation of France's great orchestra, which is the Paris Conservatory Orchestra. And I mean, it was invented by the conductor Habeneck to play Beethoven. And so the French had an even more parochial view of what a symphony could be than the Germans or the English in many, many ways. I mean, the Franck Symphony caused a riot when it was performed because it used an English horn and a slow movement and a harp. And it was it was considered to be, you know, unspeakably not symphonic. It reeked of the theater. And Franck was a composer who had no association with the theater. Yeah, I mean, he wrote a couple operas. He did in Hulda, which we've just finally had recorded for the first time ever, a zillion years after he died. Turns out to be a very beautiful work and a very moving work. The guy was far more varied than people gave him credit for being. But here was this organist who wrote fabulous organ music, who was considered almost a church composer in France, who wrote a symphony, and it's in his mature style, a totally mature work, completely, completely, you know, without any kind of obvious homage to the Beethoven tradition of symphonic writing. And that caused just, oh my goodness, bleeping hysteria in France among critics who were eager to be as Germanic as they possibly could be when it came to symphonic writing. So, so, so that hurt the symphony as well, its reputation. And then finally, last but not least, there is the history of the work in performance. It's had lots and lots of bad performances and lots of performances which are in bad taste, which vulgarize the music. Now, you could argue that it's a weakness of Franck's style, that it lends itself to such vulgarization. What does that mean, vulgarization? It means, you know, tempos that, that come and go, the push-me-pull-you approach, it's slow, then it's fast. Then when the tune comes back, you slow it down to half speed and blast it out on the brass as loudly as you can. And, you know, you, you can do things to this symphony that really are fairly tacky sounding. They're tacky sounding in retrospect because, you know, later music followed this style and there was a lot of music in that style that was quite tacky. And so we, you know, it's the same thing, for example, with Korngold, you know, in film music, you know, people say, oh, film music is tacky and Korngold, you know, Korngold's earlier music is, is tacky because he wrote film music and lowered himself, that kind of thing, you know, where it, it's the virtue of hindsight. But, you know, and, and it's ironic because the Franck Symphony was the progenitor of a huge and vastly fabulous school of composition and symphonic writing. You know, you've got Dandy and Roussel and Magnard and Chausson and I mean, just this wonderful constellation of French symphonies all written in this Francian style. And he deserves credit for producing that style, but some of them sucked and some of them are masterpieces. And the fact that some of them sucked goes back to, you know, we, we tend to go back and blame it on the original model, which isn't fair at all, because the original model doesn't suck and it's not tacky. So, so for all of those reasons, to summarize, let's, let's summarize it up. Horrifying European romantic nationalism in the 19th century and beyond, because it's still with us, unfortunately. That's one thing. The, 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 German, the German unwillingness to accept symphonic style that is not a part of like, you know, what they consider to be German. The English puritanical Anglican disdain for the sensuality and, and obvious sexiness and, 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 and heart on sleeve passion of French music. That's a biggie. It's a bigly, biggie in Eng bigly. It's a biggie in the English speaking world generally. And then there's, there's, you know, the fact that 
Franck himself was who he was, when he was, and then he wrote a symphony, which doesn't fit anybody's exact model. I mean, he gets no credit for the original genius that he was in creating this symphony and this particular symphonic form. I mean, he gets credit for doing it, but it's not considered always a good thing. And so there you have it. And then, of course, the performance history of the work itself. That's why, frankly, the Monteur performance is so important in the discography, because, because it shows all of us just what a classy work it really is. Maybe that's the most important thing of all, that subjective impression of, 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 of being a serious work and not being some sort of like, you know, vulgar, vulgar showpiece thing. You know, the ultimate in vulgarity being, of course, Leopold Stokowski's performance, which I love. But, you know, you have to you have to have a healthy enjoyment of, of you know, fun vulgarity, which is what that performance is. But, you know, however you slice it, uh, the work historically has had the dice the cards, the cards, the dice rolled against it, the cards stacked against it. Pick your analogy, take one. Um, and it's for all of those reasons. It's a really interesting aesthetic phenomenon. Somebody should write a treatise about it, I mean, or a dissertation. So there you have it. I hope that gives you some sort of sense of why this work doesn't get the love that it surely deserves consistently. It comes and it goes. Let's hope it just sticks around because it deserves to. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.